We don't know for sure where Sandragupta Maurya, the first Mauryan king, was from, but the sources agree that he wasn't the Brahmin. His ascent to kingship, according to a tradition brought about by his soon-to-be chief minister Kotilya, also called Chanakya or Vishnu Gupta, sees the overthrow of the Nanda dynasty and the start of the Mauryan one. Archaeological insight is very limited for this period, and some of the main sources used to reconstruct this time frame are the Arthashastra, remnants of Megasthenes Indica, and King Ashoka's inscriptions. First, let's consider the Arthashastra. Katilya is the person traditionally thought to be the author of this tome on statecraft, and indeed the text arguably self-describes itself as having been written by Kotilya. But the Arda Shastra, as it arrives to us, likely dates from at least 200 CE, a near 400 years after the end of the Mauryan dynasty. Some are sympathetic to the argument that it's been built around the main source, or even compiled from a number of prior sources reflecting multiple authors, and perhaps Cotillia was indeed the core source, or at least one of the authors. Kangol defends the view that the Ardashastra may be that of Cotillia's, suggesting that it was articulated before the Mauryan overthrow of the Nanda kingdom, which would help make sense as to why the Ardashastra is seemingly written from the perspective of a smaller state that is looking to conquer others and establish a great one. While the Arda Shastra arrives with a host of problems regarding how to interpret it in relation to the actual nature of the Mauryan Empire, another source for these times, the Indica, written by the four-year ambassador of the Seleucid Empire to the Mauryan Empire, Megasthenes, only arrives to us in fragments paraphrased by later Greek and Roman authors. We also know Megasthenes to have gotten some things wrong, which casts something of a haze upon the already limited information we get from his work. Like the Arda Shastra, Megasthenes has a view of imperial control well beyond anything that can be reasonably thought about the Mauryan Empire. And indeed, it may better reflect the view from the capital where control and order was presumably more capable of thoroughness. Another major source for this period comes from Sandragupta's grandson, the third king of the Mauryan dynasty, Ashoka, from whom we have numerous inscriptions on rocks and pillars declaring his edicts and his message of Dhamma. Vedic Puranas, Buddhist texts, and Jaina texts offer insight into the Mauryan Empire as well. Sandragupta gained the throne around 321 BC, and he retained as the capital city the city of Pataliputra. It's generally thought that under him most of the conquest of the Mauryan Empire occurred, and of particular clarity under Sandragupta is what soon came to be the great western extent of the empire. The Seleucid king, Seleucus Nicator, invaded Sandragupta's territory and was seemingly rebuffed fairly successfully as what followed was a treaty accepting that the Mauryan Empire controlled Arachosia, Gidrosia, and Parapomisidae, and a Seleucid princess was sent over in diplomatic marriage as well, perhaps being married to Sandragupta himself. As for Sandragupta, his sole compromise was sending 500 elephants to Seleucus. It was in the aftermath of this treaty that Megasthenes was sent over to Sandragupta's court after 305 BC. For the sake of getting some sense of the kind of state established, let's consider, admitting to the deficiencies of this source, some of the things mentioned in the Ardashastra. The Arda Shastra, which is addressed to the king, speaks of many aspects of running a successful state. There's a standardized taxation system and a network of spies sent out amongst the people. The protection of the king through secret passageways and other means is mentioned. It lists numerous ministers and stresses the importance of the king being available to the ministers. The king's ideal daily schedule is given as well, broken up into detailed one-and-a-half-hour increments. On a more local level, the administrative system runs from collections of a mere five villages up to a headquarters for collections of 800 villages. Justice and good order are also important in the Arda Shastra, and the king is to prevent people from bad actors and natural disasters, as well as support some of the less fortunate. Jaina texts suggest a connection between Sandragupta and the Jains, positing a relationship between Sandragupta and the Jaina Badrabahu, 
the latter of which prophesied to Sandragupta about an impending famine, and Sandragupta is said to have then given up the kingship and accompanied Bhadrabahu to Karnataka in the south and there committed ritual suicide by starvation. Sandragupta's son and successor, Bindusara, has a reign we're very uninformed about from around 297 to 273 BC, and to what extent he's responsible for establishing the vast expanse of the empire is unclear. It may have been under Bindusara's reign that the coming king Ashoka led a campaign to put down a revolt in Taxila. Bindusara may have been somewhat close to the Ajivika sect, and Greek sources mention two ambassadors sent to Bindusara, a Dionysius from Ptolemaic Egypt and Deimachus from Antiochus of Syria. After Bindusara's reign, some sort of chaos seems to have occurred, and there is an interregnum of some five years. However, having eliminated his rivals, Ashoka controlled the throne by 268 BC. Ashoka is said to have killed off 99 of his brothers before gaining the throne. And from Ashoka's reign, we learn of the only specifically known Mauryan conquest, that of Kalinga. Ashoka is depicted by Buddhist texts as having been particularly prone to violence and cruelty in his early years, even visiting hell for inspiration before returning and building a hell on earth to punish whom he wanted. From the Buddhist perspective, which depicts Ashoka as having undergone a sudden conversion later in life, these tales of his early life play the role of a great contrast to the pious and more peaceful post-Buddhist conversion Ashoka. But although Ashoka did sympathize with the Buddha's teaching, his sympathies grew more gradually than Buddhist tradition would have it, and Ashoka more particularly focused on a core ethos that transcended group differences. His Dhamma proclamations are not neatly Buddhist in type, and he never makes mention of core Buddhist teachings like the Eightfold Path or the Goal of Nibbana. Buddhist texts credit Ashoka with many pro-Buddhist activities, including the building of many stupas containing relics of the Buddha, making pilgrimage to important Buddhist sites, and even convening the third Buddhist council in his capital of Pataliputra. After the council meeting, the Mahavamsa posits that Ashoka sent out people on missions to spread Buddhism. The extent of the truth in the Buddhist texts aside, Ashoka himself tells us about Buddhist sympathies in his inscriptions. In Minor Rock Edict 1, he refers to himself as a Sakya, or lay follower of the Buddha, and describes how over the prior years he'd grown very zealous in his closeness with the Buddhist Sangha. Minor Rock Edict 3 has him addressing the Sangha and recommending six Buddhist texts on Dhamma for the monks and nuns to listen to and reflect upon. Whatever the extent of Ashoka's Buddhist sympathies, he's clear in his support of other sects more generally and encourages a pluralistic approach. He opens Major Rock Edict 12 with, King Devanampriya Priyadarsan is honoring all sects ascetics or householders, with gifts and honors of various kinds. But Devanampriya does not value either gifts or honors so highly as this, that a promotion of the essentials of all sects should take place. Later in the same edict, he reiterates his interest in the essential morality of the various sects, and he says again that he desires, quote, that a promotion of the essentials of all sects should take place, unquote. Major Rock Edict 13 describes a turning point of Ashoka's harshness in the aftermath of the conquest of Kalinga. He describes his distress over all the death and suffering brought about in the war, and he calls for no further conquest, and that if conquest should ensue, it should be conducted far less harshly, as conquest by Dhamma is the ideal conquest. Ashoka's Dhamma is the center of his attention and is found in almost all of his inscriptions. Some inscriptions even clarify Dhamma's meaning further. Major Rock Edict 11 describes Dhamma as good behavior towards slaves and servants, obedience to mother and father, generosity towards friends, acquaintances, and relatives, and towards shramanas and brahmins, and abstention from killing living beings. Under Ashoka, there were five regional administrative units, one above the rest based out of the capital Pataliputra, and the other four headed by governors who were usually closely related to the king. The four other power bases were Suvarnagiri in the south, 
Ujjayin to the west, Taxila on the northwest, and finally Tosali. Ashoka describes his subjects as his children and had inscribed, Just as with regard to my own children, I desire that they may be provided with all kinds of welfare and happiness in this world and the next. Rock Edict VI has Ashoka proclaiming that he furthered the availability of the king to various reporters posted around the empire, including at times when I am eating, or in the harem, or in the inner apartment, or even in the cowpen, in the palanquin, or in the parks. He also mentions many minister types, including those he sent out to spread Dhamma. After Ashoka, there were a number of kings about whom little is known. Across their some 50 years of rule, the empire fell apart into independent entities until the Mauryan dynasty finally ended with Brahadrata. The following is a probable listing of the order of reigns for the kings following Ashoka. There is Dasarata, then Samprati, Salisuka, Divavarman, Satadhanvin, and finally Brahadrata, who was assassinated by his Brahmin top general around 181 BC. The Brahmin general took over the kingdom of Magadha and thus ended the Mauryan dynasty. When we return to India's story, we'll consider the less unified times following the Mauryan Empire.